Today, we're looking at the water cycle and water insecurity. We've already covered um, 5.2a, which was looking at the hydrological cycle as an open system of linked processes of inputs, flows, and outputs. You must know at this point all the words uh, which are associated with those, such as what convectional rainfall is, what interception is, infiltration, runoff, through flow, percolation, groundwater flow, and so on. You have to know those terms before moving on and understand what they are and how they link together. So we're going to move on to 5.2b, which is uh, shown here. So if we just load this sheet up. <coughs> So what we've got on here, and to break down the title, we're still in a drainage basin, still an open system, but we're just trying to increase our understanding of it. And this one wants us to focus on the physical factors that determine the inputs, flows, and outputs. And you've got a list you have to cover in brackets. But what the exam tends to do is give you a real drainage basin, and you'd have to look at how some of the factors within that drainage basin might influence these inputs, flows, and outputs. So if other ones outside these four, climate, soils, vegetation, geology, and relief, I'm sorry, that's a five, you can, um, you, you, you can absolutely use them, but make sure you know the ones in those brackets. So um, we've got a couple of exam questions there, which are the kind of thing you'll face, but moving on from that, so the relative importance of physical factors. So relative importance means relative to each other of different physical factors that influence the flows and the stores and the um, inputs. So how and influence how the water travels through this drainage basin. So that's the key here. So if we have, for example, a physical factor such as um, geology, if we think about the rocks which are underneath the soils, the parent rock, we put it really simply if you've got an impermeable rock a rock which won't let water through that's going to reduce how much water can go through the soil into that bedrock because it will physically stop it at that point which means a soil might a soils might fill up with water more quickly meaning less infiltration and so on so it will have a knock-on effect equally a climate will change how water travels through the system as well so if we get um, a climate where you have lots of very intense storms like we have on the, um, in the equatorial uh, basin, the rainforests, in fact, if you look at the frost textbook, we've got a map here on page 27, the dark green areas are areas of very high annual rainfall, uh, somewhere between 1950 and 2000 millimeters per year. So here we've got lots and lots of rain. So if everything else stayed the same, you would expect the soils to be saturated, full of water, and you'd expect lots of runoff. Well, if we look at the deserts, if you think about that, you can have lots of sand, or sandy soils in the Sahara Desert, say. So we'll just uh, circle that just in case. So oh, I can't use the marker on here. So the Sahara Desert, in this area here, you'll end up with um, uh, sandy soils, so that would mean you're going to get very lots of infiltration. However, it's not going to be that much rain. So as a percentage of the rain that falls, nearly all of it will just sink straight into the ground because it's dry and it's full of air holes. Um, but um, equally, if we look at um, our climate, we get really wet winters but drier summers. So again, that will impact on our drainage basins. So that's how you've got to think. You've just got to think about how different factors, in this case, physical factors, affect how the water moves through this system. So going back to this, first of all, if we think about climate, climate is fundamental because it determines pretty much all the inputs to our drainage basin, the rain. It also, it's not just the, um, the precipitation type because it generates in terms of um, do we get lots of relief rainfall or a, or a graphic or do we get lots of convectional rainfall, but also the patterns when it rains for how long. Do you have a season where it's really wet like in the uh, savannah grasslands and then a season where it's very dry? Uh, 
that will change completely season to season, what happens as the water travels through our drainage basin or our hydrological cycle. So it also will change evaporation. So if it's hot, you'll get more evaporation. So the rainforests are pretty hot, but they also get lots of input. So you're going to get lots of evaporation, but you're also going to get lots of rain going in. Although as you get to the rainforest margins where it gets a longer dry season, you might you do end up in, the, uh, in those dry seasons, the soils can dry out. It even leads to fires and so on. But the, the key point being, once the soils are dry, drier, when it does rain on those soils, they've got a lot of capacity to absorb the water. So you're likely to get lots of infiltration. Whereas at the end of the wet season, the soils are likely to be completely full of water or the airspace is taken up. So when more rain was to f falls on that, you'll get lots of surface runoff because infiltration will stop. Now, you're not really, the, the, the way of dealing with this topic is not learning each scenario off by heart, but learning how to think it logically through. So what will happen if this happens and what's the knock-on effect? Um, also, the climate will influence vegetation in the area. So the rainforests are there because of the, partly because of the climate, because it rains most of the year round and it's, it's pretty much got ideal growing season for those very tall trees because it's, um, it's, it's warm and it's humid and so on, stuff you've studied before. So... Between them, the plant uptake, transpiration, interception are all influenced by climate in that sense. They're sort of linked together. Although we have to look at vegetation on its own later. So if you've got a forest, it's going to have a very different level of interception to grassland. Also, the climate will influence the soil type, which is something else we're going to look at later. But if you look at our uh, moors where the peat's developed, one of the reasons it's developed there is because it's wet and cold. So it's constantly waterlogged, which means uh, the material which has um, been deposited there can't rot, which is what you need for peat to form. But equally in other areas, you've got permafrost. And those, that permafrost zone, well, if, if you think about how the, the hydrological cycle changed there, in winter when it's all completely frozen and the active layer's frozen, it's just, all the water is just going to sit and stay. But in the summer and spring melt, you're going to get loads of surface runoff because it's going to be frozen underneath, deeper in the soil, which is pretty much like a big impermeable layer. The very top surface area will melt in the sun and all that water is then just going to flow over the surface and the rivers are going to get very full and so on. And then it will all freeze up again in winter. So what I've left you here is some, some things to think about and you can perhaps think about different places around the world. Just one thing to mention here that weather is um, the state of the atmosphere at any given time or another way of saying that is it's short term rains today it's fine it, it stops the next day even within an hour the weather can change and it does whereas climate these are long-term averages normally calculated over 40 years so britain's got a maritime uh, climate or a temperate climate where we don't get extremely cold in winter we don't get extremely hot in summer and so on changes very slowly does climate so our climate might mean that in winter or at the end of winter going into spring our soils are going to be full of water because it's been cold for a long time and we've had more rainfall than evaporation so it's meant that the um, the water's built up whereas the end of summer our soils tend to be very dry and they tend to have and they tend to have lots of capacity for infiltration because they've been drying up all summer because it's been hotter and the rainfall has been less. So what you need to do here is when you read the textbooks, I'll do a bit of thinking about different areas of the world and how climate might influence how water travels through this system, thinking about precipitation, interception, so on. I would have this diagram on the previous sheet. Just let it load up. So it's taken from the WAF textbook. But how are these things going to be changed by physical the physical factors you're looking at? So a sandy soil, it will increase infiltration, which will reduce surface storage, which will reduce surface runoff. But equally, if it's a really dry climate, it's, you're going to have less vegetation storage as well. 
because there's going to be less vegetation growing there. So think about the knock-on effects as you work through the system for any particular scenario. For soils, again, in the bold type, I've just written the basics, but the key idea really here is each soil can has a maximum infiltration capacity. So if you get more rainfall in per second, the rainfall intensity, than the infiltration, infiltration capacity, then anything above that or the surplus to that will end up as surface storage or surface runoff. So if you put 10 units a second on the ground, the soil absorbs eight units a second. That's going to leave two units a second on the surface and they're going to build up and if as, as depending on how long it rains for. A deeper soil will be able to absorb more water before it becomes saturated. And effectively, as soon as the soil becomes saturated, it effectively becomes in, uh, impermeable, which means you're going to get lots of surface runoff. Clay, as a general rule, any soil which has got lots of clay in it, if you think about clay, it's very sticky, but also the particles in clay are very small. There's very, very small air spaces there, so it slows down infiltration. So clay soils get waterlogged really easily, and you tend to get a lot more water sat on the surface. Whereas a sandy soil, well, it's like pouring water on a beach, it just goes straight through it, big air spaces. <coughs> Also, you might consider with soils, and it links back to climate, if you keep getting episodes of rain, and then another one, then another one, the, ch the probability of saturated soils goes up. But also that's related to things like evaporation, transpiration, and vegetation, and so on. And hopefully, well, as the examining board would say, the, the, the students who really understand this will be able to play around with these and show they're all linked together. They won't sort of just deal with them strictly in isolation. So if we move to vegetation, the best way of looking at vegetation is thinking about the extreme types. So if you have a forest, a very a rainforest or a, a woodland, uh, an oak woodland in this country, it's going to have high interception and those trees are going to take lots of water out of the soil. Also tree roots improve the drainage of the soil so more water will infiltrate as well. If you get rid of the trees, interception rates fall. The water taken up by the soil, uh, sorry, the water taken out of the soil by the vegetation falls. And it depends what you put on there. If you put cattle on there, they can trample the soil and make it really compact, which can reduce infiltration and so on. As a general rule, trees are very good at reducing flood risk because they slow everything down and they absorb water. Um, eventually, we have to look at hydrographs and, and something called a lag time and how quickly the water gets to the river. Trees slow everything down. And um, you could read ahead in the textbooks on that, about hydrographs and so on. In fact, just while we're on this, if you were to read the WAF textbook or your textbook a little bit further on, it talks about hydrographs and water budgets down here, and these hydrographs, which is page 36 of Frost. Or the WAF textbook, this first chapter is brilliant, particularly between page 50 and 57 or 55, 57 which um, really explains how all this works. For example, on this page 56, you've got about soil type. You've got a little bit about hydrographs, which we're going to come on to later, but it'll give you a really good grounding with this textbook. This is the textbook I used when I was uh, sixth form, the WAF textbook. Right. So we've, um, so again, some things to consider there with vegetation. But if you took any particular place, you could even look at your garden and think about the impact it would have on the hydrological cycle, the different vegetation you've got in there, the different soils and so on. We've mentioned geology before. We're really talking about the rocks under the ground. A lot of most of the time they're covered in soil, but sometimes they're exposed. If you um, think um, the, 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 what it says there about the basic idea here, the impermeable parent rock, anything impermeable is going to reduce water infiltration. Even if soil sat on top of it, if um, it rains on that soil, eventually the water goes down to the base of the soil and then it tries to drain away. But if the parent rock's impermeable, it'll stop that happening. So the soil fills up with water much more quickly and it doesn't drain as well, which ultimately leads to less infiltration, more water on the surface and more surface runoff and increased flood risk when we get further in the course. So 
the the idea behind this is if you've got impermeable rock you're going to get an you're going to get um less drainage into the soil a more surface runoff if you think about when you went to malum and the limestone there although limestone is actually it doesn't it's not porous it doesn't let water through it's got great big joints in it so water which is falling on an area of limestone tends to drain into the soils very quickly if the, so there's no soil and it's just bare limestone the water goes straight into the limestone you don't tend to get many rivers at all it, they tend to disappear underground because all the water goes underground so the key idea with rock is if it's impermeable it reduces infiltration which increases the amount of water left on the surface but clearly if you've got impermeable rock but a really deep soil on top of it the two will work in opposites the deep soil will absorb lots of water but it will become saturated eventually but clearly that will link to the climate as well because there's got to be enough rain for that to happen too and the fourth one is relief now relief is the shape of the land what we're really interested in here is how steep it is and the general idea is if you've got steep gradients the water tends to flow downhill so you get more surface runoff more through flow and that water tends to end up at the bottom of the hill and in that area you tend to get saturated um, soils and sometimes more flooding so the key up now is to have a look at your textbooks and really start thinking about scenarios which would um, and physical factors or varying them which would change how the water moves through this whole system so if you made the rainfall more intense if you added rainfall a few rainfall events and uh, before and and then added another one how would that change things if you change the soil from a clay to a sandy soil what would that do to how it reacts to rainfall even silly not silly things but things like um the size of the raindrops how compact the soil is all sorts and is it falling on hills is it falling on flat land and lowland and so on you're not going to be able to remember every scenario but you do need to understand the logic which underpins all this so each change has a knock-on impact so if we were to give you a random place and ask you the likely impact, let's say if I said something like a temperate woodland in December, um, lots of previous rainfall, and because it's December, it's been um, it's been through uh, a number of months now where you've got low evaporation and high rainfall. What would happen if you got persistent drizzle or an intense storm on it, and so on? You'd have to think about how the trees would be um, they wouldn't have leaves on for instance so there'd be less transpiration less interception and so on to check once you've gone through the reading you've understood it is there's a little question here which i did at your age because it came from the WAF textbook and i've written an answer there under the help file um but don't look at that until you've had a go at it and see if you can interpret the figure as well so once you think you've understood it have a look at that question you're going to get in the exam graphs which are um, like that or not exactly like that but you're going to have to learn to think on your feet using unseen material so describe an account so describe and explain if you like in the language which you'll get in your exam for the changes which take place through this storm but you need to try and interpret the graph so be really take a bit of time to work out what it's actually showing you and how these axes work because it's not a standard line graph Okay, I'll leave it there.